My name is Stefan Guillene. I have a PhD in neurobiology from the University of Washington, and I've been doing research for about 11 years and publishing uh, my thoughts online as well. Fundamentally, excess fat mass, obesity, overweight, those conditions, as far as we know, well, I mean, this is just thermodynamic fact. It's caused by more energy entering the body than energy exiting the body. But that doesn't necessarily get us that far in terms of thinking about what obesity is, what's causing it, and how to reverse it. Anthony Scalfani, who did some work in rats back in the 1970s, and they were trying to produce dietary obesity in rats so they could study obesity. So at the time, they were, they were trying to develop a reliable model so that grad students didn't have to you know, wait a year to get fat rats. They wanted fat rats quick, and they wanted them really, really fat. And so how do you do that? Well, you can feed them a high-fat diet. That will cause them to gain fat. But Sclafani had this kind of novel idea that, as far as I know, no one had ever tried this before him. He went to the grocery store, and he bought all kinds of human junk food. He bought the kind of stuff that we eat every single day. And what he found is that in rats, those foods are exceptionally fattening. So the fat gain that those rats experienced completely outpaced anything that you could provoke by any other type of diet by far. I mean, you could put regular healthy rat chow, you know, regular healthy rat chow, it's mostly corn and soybeans. They, they're pretty healthy on the stuff. It's good for them. You can put it in their cage and they will completely ignore it. And instead they will eat chips and cookies and salami and and peanut butter and whatever, you know, Fruit Loops, whatever palatable calorie dense foods you put in there. We diverged from rodents evolutionarily tens of millions of years ago. So whatever these pathways are that are operating, that are causing us to overeat, they're extremely ancient. So these are extremely deeply seated uh, brain adaptations. So we've essentially purified these palatability factors that are the things that our brains are kind of looking for. We're kind of hardwired to look for these properties in food. We're hardwired to look for calorie density, to look for carbohydrate, to look for fat, to look for sugar. And it turns out that our ancestors just weren't as good as we are at getting all those things all in a single meal. Their food was a lot simpler. And that's kind of like what our brains are adapted to. They're not adapted to being hit with a sledgehammer of these um, compelling food properties at every meal. And, you know, these things, I, I won't get too deep into the neurobiology of it, but these food properties cause dopamine to be released by the brain, which is a, a reinforcement signal that reinforces motivation and behavior. And if you get excessive dopamine release, for example, co by cocaine, or especially crack cocaine or methamphetamine or heroin, excessive dopamine release leads to um, all the behaviors associated with drug seeking being prioritized over everything else in your life. And we call that addiction. They're prioritized to an abnormally strong degree. And um, it turns out that a lot of people by all appearances, appear to be addicted to many of our modern foods. They're not getting addicted to celery sticks. They're not getting addicted to lentils. What they're getting addicted to is these foods that have a combination of extreme uh, reward factors, these things that provoke dopamine release, fat, carbohydrate, salt, sugar, combinations of all these things together that our ancestors would never have experienced. So when it comes to a you know piece of a uh, piece of pizza or ice cream or candy or actually chocolate's a, a good example, um, these things reinforce behavior, in my opinion, to a degree that you would have not have seen, um, that our ancestors would not have experienced. And people develop, you know, it's controversial whether there is such a thing as food addiction. Some researchers believe that there is, some researchers don't kind of believe the concept, but certainly people exhibit 
addiction-like behaviors toward food. And most of us, even if we're not addicted to food per se, will still feel compelled to eat some of these foods, even though we know it's not good for us. So we might not be addicted, but we might, you know, we could stop eating it. Sure, if somebody put a, you know, a gun to your head, you wouldn't eat it. But that doesn't mean that it's easy to control those impulses, especially if you're depleted, if your um, impulse control is depleted because you're tired, you worked all day, you've been making big decisions all day, you're stressed out, you haven't slept enough, you're going to have a higher level of impulsivity and it's going to be more difficult for you to make constructive choices in the face of these very, very compelling foods. And so I think from a dietary perspective, it's very important to cook for yourself, make foods from simple, uh, single ingredients. If, if you're able to, I think restaurants tend to be a real pitfall. You don't realize uh, exactly what you're eating when you walk into a restaurant. Um, avoiding processed food. But I think another thing that's really, really important and doesn't always necessarily make it to the top of the pile in these types of discussions is controlling your food environment. Because I think that a lot of people have some idea about how to eat healthy. Now, it, they may not be optimally educated on the subject, but the average person doesn't believe that Coca-Cola is good for you. They don't believe that candy is good for you or that pizza is good for you. They eat it because they like it. They eat it because it's there, because it's easy. So controlling your food environment and creating a situation where you don't have, essentially where good choices are easy. You've set it up in advance so that good choices are easy, poor choices are, are more difficult, maybe even not even available in your house. And if you can create a situation like that, you minimize your need for willpower and you create a situation where the path of least resistance is one of eating healthy foods.